Transylvanian Moonrise, a secret initiation in the mysterious land of the gods. Radu Sinemar and Peter Moon I quickly decided to go to Bucharest, following the directions closely. I took that decision by myself although the old attachments and habits were still trying to draw me back. An obscure fear was pervading my heart, but the appeal of the extraordinary chance I was given was stronger than the incertitude. Strangely, although I knew I was offered a life of almost two thousand years, I had no actual thoughts about what I was going to do. I was thinking that I should come with various plans, ideas, and desires, but instead, it was as if my mind was paralyzed at the thought that I might live in this physical body for thousands of years. In short, I got to Bucharest and found the address quite quickly. It was a four-story block of flats in a quiet neighborhood. As I read in the letter, the door was unlocked. I entered a one-bedroom flat that was modestly furnished and it seemed like no one was there. On the living room table was, in a big envelope, a paper with directions, a key, and an enormous amount of money for those times. I was told to leave that place immediately and go to another address in Bucharest which this time was a house. I should remain there for three days until contacted by a certain someone. The key was for the house and the money for expenses. Counting the money, I realized that it was enough for me to live comfortably for one year. I was advised though not to leave the house unless absolutely necessary. The fridge was also generously stocked with food. It seemed like it was all part of a movie script, but what I was asked to do was quite easy. I was engrossed in thoughts for a while and then reread the directions. It looked like everything was already set up to offer me an unending existence. Still, your life in this physical body was going to end after approximately 2000 years, I said. Indeed. It seems that the effect of the alloy is weaker than the alchemical elixir, but as far as I know, no one lived the maximum period that the object offers. Therefore, a direct verification of this theory, probably coming from the beginning of the tradition, is missing. We can't be sure that the message hasn't altered with the passing of time. But where was the object? I asked impatiently. Was it brought by a person you met? Things were a bit more complicated. After I settled in the other house, which was also in a quiet neighborhood but on the other side of town, I waited for the intermediary. The place was very comfortable, bordering on luxurious, but I noticed there was no phone. The cable was there but there was no handset. Maybe that was a security measure so I would not try to contact someone. Just as I had been told, the intermediary arrived after three days. While waiting for him, I spent my time reading and watching TV. In order to avoid creating any kind of troubles, I refrained from going out. At the end of that period, I was a little bored but the curiosity and interest for what was coming were still with me. The respective person who arrived was a mature gentleman who confirmed that he was sent by my ancient relative. Although I overwhelmed him with a torrent of questions, he remained inflexible. All that he told me was to just be patient and have trust. He then took out a camera from his bag and asked me to stand in front of an empty wall. After he took my picture, he noticed that I was confused. In order to avoid an unpleasant scene, he explained that the photos were necessary for my new identification documents. He then told me that he would be back in three days and that I needed to be ready to go by then. At this point, I contemplated going back to the ordinary life I seemed to be so easily giving up. The feeling of uncertainty I was experiencing, compounded by a lack of information, made me realize that the situation could be dangerous. Why would I need another set of identification documents? But particularly, what sort of documents were we talking about? After all, my ID card and driver's license were still valid and a passport was out of the question as Romanian citizens of those times were not allowed to possess such a document. Only then did it suddenly dawn on me that I was going to leave the country, but not by illegally crossing the border, but by actually passing through one of the border crossings with a legal and valid passport. My heart shrunk under the waves of emotion and fear that gripped my imagination. 
I could already see myself caught, locked up and beaten in the cellars of the feared national security, subjected to unending, exhausting and often very violent interrogations. I was nervously pacing through the house, not knowing what to do. My logic was telling me that because Romanian citizens were not allowed to own a passport, it meant that I was going to have a fake ID under a different nationality. Sweating profusely, I threw myself on the bed. I was musing that I had just uselessly complicated my life just before building a decent future for myself with a family and maybe, as much as possible in a communist country, a career. And for what? After all, my life was good for as long as it would have lasted. I did not need one or two thousand years during which time I would most definitely become tired. Obviously, all of those thoughts were just my preservation instinct pushing me, as much as still possible, on the path of mediocrity and banality. After a while, I started to calm down and get another perspective on the issue at hand. For example, I had to admit that my ancestor always respected my free will. In no way or form had he forced me to take a certain decision. It had always been my choice just as it actually still was at this new moment. Even then, at least apparently, I was still free to abandon it all and resume my previous life without anyone losing out or suffering. I would have quickly found an explanation for my fiancé and family, and the impressive amount of money I would have brought back would have made everyone happy. On the other hand, my ancestor would have remained as inaccessible and unknown as he was to that day, and I'm pretty sure that all of the arrangements made by him through all of these mysterious intermediaries wouldn't have provided any clues to the authorities. I was forced to admit that, due to the wisdom, experience and connections accumulated during his lengthy life, my ancestor was able to act from a distance in a very intelligent and practically flawless way. He must have predicted the eventuality of my abandonment, but he did so with an amazing delicacy as he was prepared to reward me for all of the inconveniences I had experienced by giving me that huge amount of money. My final conclusion was that I had to make my own destiny. At the same time, I was starting to see that instead of always and selfishly asking for proof of what was written in the letter, and I'm referring here to the mysterious personalized object, it was first of all necessary that I show at least a minimal proof of deserving it. Instead of having an inquisitorial attitude and way of thinking, as if eternal life was my birthright without any effort, it was much wiser to realize that what I was going to be offered was actually of an inestimable richness for my destiny as well as an extraordinary opportunity for my evolution. Otherwise, I would have been in danger of not appreciating the true value of my ancestors present, and without any doubt, my ignorance could have caused enough mistakes to cost me my life. I understand perfectly, I said. I know these aspects as they have also been presented to me as a result of other circumstances, by a very special person. Eleanor smiled understandingly. I think you are talking about Mr. Cesar Brad, aren't you? Indeed, it seems he is a being that has achieved a high degree of consciousness, Eleanor said thoughtfully. You too are part of this complex mechanism involving remarkable beings. Shortly, you will realize that nothing in life is by chance and that events correlate and synchronize in ways that are often astonishing for the common human being. It is a great art to see these synchronicities and then understand their hidden meaning. At the same time, if you can do that, it is a clear sign that you have evolved. But, let me come back to what I was saying. Upon more reflection from my part over these aspects, I was gradually becoming firmly convinced that I was supposed to lead a certain life and one that was closely related to my ancestor. So, I decided to fully abandon myself to the plan that the great alchemist had prepared for me in every detail. There were some risks of course, but my decision was already unshakable. I still had a few slight hesitations at first due to the attachment I had towards my fiancé and my family, but I calmed down by telling myself that I would still have all the time in the world to go back to them. Inside of me, however, I knew perfectly well that it would never happen. After three days, the grey-haired man came back as somber and as calm as the first time. As I suspected, there was a forged passport that I was going to use to cross the border. My expectations were exceeded, however, 
when I noticed that it was a diplomatic passport and that I was listed as a Belgian citizen. The gentleman explained that it was made so because of my knowledge of French which made it all the more credible for the border officials. He was going to accompany me to Brussels and we were flying there the next afternoon. To be a bit more concise, everything went well and the customs officers even wished us a bon voyage. By nightfall, I was already settled in a very luxurious villa in the capital of Belgium, somewhere in a residential area of the city. The man that accompanied me retreated discreetly after making sure that I had everything I needed. He also told me that I was going to be visited by someone special later that evening. I smiled lightly. This was probably going to be the moment of my long-awaited meeting with my relative. I have to admit that sometimes life changes so quickly and spectacularly that you need a lot of discernment and self-control in order to cope as much as possible. A week earlier, I was planning a family together with my fiancé in Oradia, Romania. Now I was in Belgium with another identity and waiting to meet a relative a couple hundred years old. Quite shocking, isn't it? Eleanor laughed casually and got up to turn the fight on. It was almost dark outside and the Tibetan Lama had not arrived yet. With the magic of his story now interrupted for the time being, I noticed the time and was startled. It is quite late. Do you think there will still be a meeting tonight? I asked skeptically. Without any doubt, answered Eleanor, although I am a bit surprised by this delay myself. Let's be patient. He will arrive shortly and you will then be faced with a great surprise. I could not understand any of these mysteries, but Eleanor promised that there would not be too long of a wait. If so, please continue your story and tell me what happened that evening in Brussels, I said, settling as comfortable as I could in my armchair and tasting one of the cookies I had been offered. I met the master alchemist, my ancestor. I was nervous but he seemed to understand me very well and thanked me for trusting him and his letter. He looked approximately thirty-two to thirty-three years old and, please believe me, I was bewildered in trying to justify what was happening to me as being a farce, it being impossible that someone looking like the man facing me could have already lived for longer than five hundred years. I immediately expressed my doubts. He looked at me, calmly and seriously and asked what exactly I thought a five-hundred-year-old man should look like. That rendered me quiet and I realized the ridiculousness of the situation. He then went on to tell me that I would not be able to convince myself of the existence of the secret society and the extraordinary effect the mysterious object has on the lives of those it was made for until a few decades pass. My ancestor advised me to use this waiting time actively, educating myself and learning the mysteries of alchemy in order to be capable of ascending to the next higher stage of my evolution. He offered to show and provide me everything I needed in order to do that. I can feel that you have a remarkable potential, my ancestor said, but even so, you will see that those starting out on the path of this tradition differently integrate the time they have at their disposal, time that is much longer than the life of an ordinary man. That is why your progress in the alchemical sciences will be quite slow. It is possible to be hundreds of years old, maybe even thousands of years old, until you reach total fulfillment in your alchemical work. During this very long period of time, you might have to cope with major transformations, maybe even dramatic ones. But all of these will help you gather immense experience that will fully contribute to the complexity of your destiny. You could ask me, he said. How is it possible that some alchemist could manage to reach the highest achievements of their work in just one ordinary lifetime? This is indeed possible, but in such cases, they are already born with high merits on this path, having achieved them in previous lives. I'm almost sure that you are not familiar with aspects of metempsychosis or those referring to the esoteric laws of action and reaction within the universe. That's why the explanations I'm going to give you now might seem hilarious and illogical, but you will then have plenty of time to understand and observe these aspects. It's good for you to know though that the extraordinary longevity that is now yours can offer you the possibility of evolving spiritually much faster than following the cycles of birth and death that other people go through. My ancestor stopped and watched me carefully to see what reactions his words generated, continued Eleanor. 
I was incapable of uttering any words as I couldn't understand the significance of what he told me. Now I know exactly what my ancestor meant. These are basic aspects he was explaining. At that time of my life, however, they were a completely unexplored subject to me. Eleanor stopped his narration to ask me how familiar I was with these notions. I told him that I did not know much about it, but I would appreciate it if he could tell me more. Destiny and Reincarnation You know very well that the issue of reincarnation causes controversy even nowadays although there is countless evidence that proves this truth, said Eleanor. The need to maintain as effective control as possible over people has caused some leaders in the shadows of political and economical forces to orient science and the education of the masses towards a very simple and concise conclusion, there is no soul, there is no spirit, and after the demise of the physical body, nothing happens as it all returns into nothingness. In other words, according to this modern ideology, someone disappears completely when they die and without a trace. Although aberrant and even lacking logic, this idea caught on and a large majority embraced it, mainly because they feel it saves them from useless troubles and complicating their lives. Some even slip into a very wrong mentality that can throw them into the depths of desperation. In other words, they think that if we only have one life, and there is nothing else afterwards, it means they can commit all kinds of acts. This applies in particular to evil and even abominable acts, done for purely selfish reasons, as they will not have to pay for them after they die. You can see how this can be a real problem, and it is not by chance that the modern society is confronted with an unprecedented wave of vices and crime. The fight for justice is just on the surface as it can't crush it in the bud. The ideology perpetrated upon us is corrupt and false but is kept so deliberately to cause chaos and to allow the elite to control everything they possibly can. I am aware of these aspects, of course, I said. But your ancestors' perspective on the possibility of a more rapid evolution is interesting. Yes, the extension of life while in the physical body is extraordinary, commented Eleanor. At a glance, it might look like it takes a very long time to get a certain result while others, living a normal life, obtain the same effects in just a few years or tens of years. In reality, they are only continuing what they started many lives before. Let's imagine the following situation. I start to study the mysteries of alchemy. At the same time as me, another ordinary man living a normal lifetime is initiated on the same path. Let's also assume that we both progress at about the same pace. After a few tens of years, he will inevitably die in his soul, carrying, among others things, the quintessence of all of the knowledge he has gathered up to that point, will translate into a superior level of creation. For most human beings, this level is represented by the subtle astral universe which is much broader than the physical universe. Eleanor took a short break to have a sip of tea. He then continued with his explanations. People do not die in the true sense of the word. I mean, they do not disappear into nothingness. They only abandon their physical carcasses, their bodies of flesh and bones that rot. Only the physical body dies. The subtle part of the being, the soul, translates into another space-time dimension of the creation that is most favorable for its continued existence. That is why it is said that there's no such thing as death. The human being, as an individual entity, never disappears but translates from one level of creation to another. This is the same as getting out of a car and getting on a train, then getting off the train and getting onto a ship. The analogy can go on and on. In each of these situations, you have a specific way of getting from one place to another and a certain degree of freedom. When comparing a physical body to a mode of transport, it is, we could say, what you can afford at that moment, what you save to pay for the ticket, be it for the bus, train or ship. If you didn't save enough, that is, if you don't have too many merits, then you walk. If you are very rich, you can then afford a ticket for even a spaceship. Analytically speaking, in this latter situation, you have access to a very elevated, subtle world. If you only have a few merits because your mistakes were many or great, 
Then the subtle dimension that your soul is projected into after the death of the body will be one full of anguish and suffering. These demarcations refer to the destiny of every human and are in full accordance to the actions, good or bad, that the respective being committed either in his terrestrial existence or in the subtle worlds. If none of this were so, there would be no difference between the worldly condition of a saint and a criminal nor a mentally retarded person and a genius. Common sense tells us that it is not by chance that a human being is born with a severe physical handicap while another is perfectly healthy and thriving, or that some suffer from childhood with all sort of anguishes, fears, and nightmares while others are happy, optimistic and very joyful.